Thank you. Am I audible to everybody? Living in the world and not being of the world. That's the thing. Thank you. Uh, this uh, world that we live in is really an illusion. It is like a dream. It is like a large play. A large stage on which we are all actors. But we do not realize this. The play is so perfect that we do not realize it is a play. And we act our part so naturally that we take it seriously as if it is real. When we see stage plays in this world, we find that good actors always act their part as if it is real. Some of them take time to get into the mood, get into the psychological motivation necessary to act that part as if it is real. The more sophisticated the audience, the more necessary it becomes to act as if the play is not a play but real. When the audience is a totality of ourselves, which means when the audience is the Lord God himself, as indeed the audience is of this play in which we are participating, we have to attain perfection in acting, which means we must act so real as if it is real. That's precisely what we are doing. We have been deprived of the awareness that we are acting on a big stage to make the acting perfect. Had we been aware of the fact that we are only acting and it's only a stage play, we would not make the play so interesting and real. No wonder we are therefore acting with so much enthusiasm that even if somebody tells us it is a stage play, we don't believe it. It is very difficult for us to comprehend how these real relationships in a real world can be stage play. But the world is not real. The world is a stage play. And we come to know about the fact that it is a stage where we are playing our role when we quit the stage. If we play the role of a king or a queen in a play, we are king or queen only on the stage. Off stage, we are our real self. Similarly, the roles we are playing on this stage in the world last only as long as the stage lasts. When we are off stage, we are no longer playing the roles that we had here. When we quit this world, which means when we leave this life stage, we realize that we were only playing a role. How do we quit this stage? either when we die or when we die while living. When we die, we can't come back and tell anyone else that it's a play. But if we die while living, we can during the same lifetime tell others that we have found out after stepping off the stage that we were merely acting. Dying while living is the name given to the ability of human beings to withdraw their attention from the physical body and therefore from the physical world and get the same experience as they would get if they actually died. If we were to withdraw our attention from the body to where we imaginatively think we belong, we will become unconscious of the body and the body will have the same experience as at the time of death. At that very moment, we will find that we belonged to some other world, the real world, and this world which we took as real was only a big stage, a big dream, and a big show that was created, a passing show, which is now over. If we relive by return to the body, we will retain the memory of our wakefulness and can convey to the other souls. And people talk that this world is full of problems, unhappiness, misery, suffering. Let us get out of this world. This is not our home. 
God could not have destined that we should stay in a place with so much unhappiness and suffering. When people talk of that, they do not realize that these feelings of suffering, pain, unhappiness are coming because we are taking the world as real. The moment we come to know the reality that the world is a play and it is set on a stage, there can be no real suffering, real unhappiness or real misery. When we play the role of a miserable person on the stage, we don't really become miserable. We are playing a role. But if we do not know we are playing a role, we become really miserable. When we come to know we are acting, we don't remain miserable. Playing the same role. Without changing our role in this world, we can become happy and enjoy any role. It does not matter what role we play. The joy of acting is not in the selection of the role, but in the perfection of acting. Therefore, irrespective of our role in this world, if we come to know that we are merely acting, we do not have any pain, misery or suffering. And what looks like pain, misery and suffering also becomes an act. We are merely acting as if we have pain. We are merely acting as if we have suffering. We are merely acting as if we have all the troubles and worries of this world. Why do people worry? They worry because they think the world is real. The moment they say the world is not real, no one can worry. All worry disappears the moment one understands this world is not real. You don't worry about the roles assigned to actors on the stage. Therefore, all worry disappears once we understand we are merely actors on the stage. Then, the title of the talk this evening really suggests that if we want to be in this world, but not of this world, we should treat the world as a big stage and play our role on it. Then we will belong to the world from where we have stepped onto the stage and yet we will act on the stage. How does one actually do it? What is the methodology of attaining a state of awareness where we can accept that this is acting and we can act keeping our real attention in the real world and only our superficial attention in the stage play world. This can be done by a detachment from this world in which we live. If we can detach ourselves from this world, the detachment will make it look that it is unreal and our real world is somewhere else. That is why the mystics have been recommending the practice of detachment. They have said, it is detachment alone that can give you the true nature of this world and the life we live on this day. Following their tip, lot of people try to practice detachment. They keep on running away from this world. They run away into ashrams, they run away into the Himalayas, they run into caves, they run away from the world, they put on funny clothes. They put on ash on their bodies, they try to mingle with the dust, they don't want to go into big cities, they don't want to meet people, they go into isolation, they try to escape this world in order to practice detachment. But they don't get detachment. Because detachment is not a physical attachment. Detachment is concerned with mental attachment. If you are mentally attached to something, you cannot escape by physically running away from that thing. We know in India a large number of ascetics, sadhus, swamis, yogis sitting on top of the Himalayas trying to escape from the world and their thoughts are all on the things they have left behind. It is natural. If my mind says I want to go with that mudra to Twin Cities and eat Shaky's pizza. And, and that says, no, no, don't attach yourself there and I avoid Shaky's and I go to Himalayas and on top of the hill I want to do meditation. When I close my eyes, I'll see nothing but Shaky's pizza. 
the more i try to run away the more i will remember it i was telling some friends today about the story of the great mystic in india when people heard the americans heard that he can give a shortcut to heaven one of them ran to him and said sir i understand you have a shortcut to heaven he said yes i have a very simple shortcut repeat three words once only and you will be in heaven he said i never heard of such a good mantra so why don't you give me this mantra so i can speak the words and go to heaven he said certainly so he gave him the three words he said just repeat a b c and you'll go to heaven there were not even three words there were just three letters this man said this looks very simple he, the swami or the mystic said just go and find a corner to sit in wherever you can find a quiet place sit there if you want to go to the top of the himalayas you can go there wherever you are in solitude go there and say a b c once and you will be in heaven so the man turned to leave with this new prescription and the swami said but there is one condition before saying a b c please don't think of banana the man tried all his life every time he started saying a b c the banana came in front of him this little suggestion thrown at that man attached him to a concept and he couldn't get out of it therefore to imagine that we can by force detach ourselves or detach our mind or detach our attention from this world and treat it like a play is not correct it doesn't happen that way the mind doesn't function on that basis people want to detach from this world in order to get attachment to the lord nobody has succeeded like that i have not come across a single person who can say he practiced detachment of this world in order to attain attachment there therefore that is not the way then what is the way detachment cannot lead to attachment the opposite is true an attachment can lead to detachment that is possible if one is so strongly attached to one thing he can forget the other it is not possible in vacuum to detach it is possible to attach so strongly with something that you become detached from the rest if you start getting attached to something not of this world you will get detached from this world when a girl wants to get married to a boy and she says to her mother mom i found my boy i am going to now date him and get married and mom says well if you want to get married to her and you want to love that boy you better forget us forget your sisters and brothers and then only you will be able to love that boy prepare yourself before you go to the boy she can try all her life and she won't forget her brothers and sisters and mom but if she falls in love with the boy automatically she will forget everybody else she won't even remember they have to give a call to her have you forgotten we also exist it is attachment with one that leads to detachment with the other therefore you have to be attached to something somebody in order to be detached from the world in the mystic school therefore they give very special importance to the role of a living master of a person who comes to become the focal point for a disciple for a seeker to attach himself or herself to therefore getting attached to the master and with the master's teaching getting attached to his inner form inside the seeker the seeker of the disciple gets detached from this world and the world becomes a stage upon which we act therefore the real secret is to love the master to such an extent that you forget the world and the world becomes a stage and on here and it doesn't bother one any more this is the secret by which one can be in this world act in this world and yet not belong to this world some people think that merely by putting on a face of good cheer and merely by saying well let's take it like play we can solve this problem taking it like play does not solve the problem if you try hard to make a real world at least the world that looks real appear to be unreal it will not appear unreal 
you can't force that apparent reality to become unreality. But if you get attached to a master, you don't have to try to do anything to the world, it will automatically become unreal and of no consequence. The mystic path or the path of mystics and saints and masters is not an artificial path. It is not a way which men have created and different groups and schools can suggest different ways. It is a natural way. It is natural to all of us. It is a natural state of being that when we are attached through love with the master within, we automatically get detached also. It is a natural law for all of us. There is no special qualification required, no special membership required, no special religion required. One can practice one's religion, go to one's church, continue to do one what is doing, do one's job, not make any change in life except the practice of attachment and love to the master, which will automatically make this world look like a stage play on which we have been acting and of no consequence, and all the worries will disappear. This is one way of achieving this end. The other way is that we see the unreality of the world by waking up from it. Which practice of meditation can achieve? If we meditate in the proper way, that is to say, and I want to add this word in the proper way because a large number of people here, influenced by Indians and Easterners coming here, are doing meditation in the improper way. What is the difference between proper meditation and improper meditation? In proper meditation, you are withdrawing your attention within yourself, behind the eyes. In improper meditation, you are putting your attention on something else. When somebody says, I am meditating, I first ask the question, where do you sit and meditate? And most of the time, people here give me an answer. We sit in a chair, or we sit in the center of a room, or we sit in the corner of a room against a wall, or we sit on the floor somewhere else, or we sit on our bed. We all talk of the room, the bed, the floor, the chair in which they sit and meditate. When you are conscious of the room, the chair, the bed, the walls of the room, the floor of the room, when you are conscious of this, and that is where you sit and meditate, your attention will remain in that room. You will go nowhere, therefore that is improper meditation. Then where should one sit? The proper place to sit for meditation, for proper meditation, the proper place to sit is behind the eyes on the head. Therefore, before you can start any meditation of any kind, you must locate yourself, seat yourself comfortably at the point where you have to reach. Therefore, you have to imagine that this building is a house, this body is a building or a house. This body is made of concrete. You freeze it, fill it and take the portion from the eyes above up to the head as the upper story, the sixth floor. Take an elevator and go to the sixth floor. Land at the point behind the eyes, imaginatively. Because you have to locate yourself imaginatively before you can start meditation. Then enter this room behind the eyes, draw an imaginative chair or sit on the imaginative floor with your imagined body and then start meditation of any kind you like. Meditation will succeed. It is only when you center yourself behind the two eyes in the third eye center that you can withdraw your attention there. Then you will become unconscious of the room in which your body is lying and you will become unconscious of your body. You will become conscious of yourself behind the eyes and ultimately you will become unconscious of the eyes and only be conscious of your real self to which you have drawn your attention. If you can do that, then you awaken immediately to the world from which you had stepped on the stage of the physical world and started acting here. And you immediately see that you have been acting all the time on the stage. This stepping off the stage 
and seeing the act is a very sure way of knowing about the nature of the stage and the nature of the acting we are doing in this world. What makes you so sure? It is very simple. When you go to sleep in these bodies and have a dream, you don't know it is a dream. The dream looks real. So long as you are watching the dream, you keep on thinking it is real. When you wake up in the morning, you immediately come to know that was not real. What makes you so sure that was not real? When you wake up in the morning, you don't check or verify or ask for any proof whether you were witnessing a dream or you were actually there in a new world. You would at once know it was a dream. You don't pinch your body, you don't open your eyes, you don't search for evidence, you don't call anybody to say, now am I awake? You know you are awake. You don't even stir in your bed to know you are awake. You can go to sleep, have a dream, wake up without turning your hands or limbs at all. You can be absolutely still in the bed and you are sleeping and dreaming. You can wake up without any movement and know that you are awake. What happens to consciousness that gives you so much certainty that you are awake and the dream has ended? It was not real. What gives you that certainty? The certainty is provided by memory, by recall that you had gone to sleep. When we get the feel of that bed, we remember we had gone to sleep in that bed. Therefore, that becomes a real world and the intervening experience becomes a dream. It is the recall of our having been in the same bed prior to the dream that makes a dream a dream. Supposing we forget. If we go to sleep and then we wake up, we forget that we had gone to sleep, we will never be able to know the difference between dream state and wakeful state. Therefore, this is the natural law of changing consciousness or levels of consciousness provided by the Lord and functioning in all of us that when we change our level of consciousness from one to another, we regain through memory the consciousness of the earlier stage which now becomes the present stage of awareness. Thus, when we are in the dream stage, we lose the awareness that we were awake at one time. When we wake up, we recall and remember that before dreaming we were also in the wakeful stage. The old life which we were leading before we went to sleep is resumed and it is not even interrupted by the dream. We have not gone into the dream. We created a dream. It was unreal. What happened to our real self? It was lying in bed sleeping. In the same way, this grand dream which we are now having, it looks so real, it becomes a dream when we wake up to a higher level of consciousness. When we wake, we not only wake to reality, we remember we were in reality all the time before this drama started. And we know exactly what we were doing. We know past lives, we know past astral lives, lives before we went into any dream. We remember previous dreams, but we also remember previous wakeful states. Therefore, the continuity of existence in the higher state of consciousness is resumed when we wake from this dream. And then this life becomes a drama and a play and acting for certain. No questions are asked. People want to know whether there is any proof or does it take time to be sure of what we are getting? Not at all. One flash of wakefulness is enough. You don't have to wake for too long to know that you are awake. When you get up from sleep, a moment of wakefulness is as good as 10 hours of wakefulness or 10 years of wakefulness. It is a quality of memory bringing you back to a different state of, level, of consciousness that constitutes wakefulness. There is a story we have in India of a king who wanted to understand how one can wake up. And he had tried all his methods and couldn't succeed. His name was King Janak. And he asked his ministers and advisors, can you tell me some easy way in which I can wake up to a higher reality and find out what all this business is about? Why are we playing our acts like this? Why have I become king? Why have you become minister? Why are these poor people poor? Why are these people sick people in hospital suffering? Why are certain living things animals? Why is life entrapped in those trees and plants? How come they are not human? Who has decided this? Why is this game going on? He said, I am really very curious to know and I am very upset. Why is it happening like this? 
I want to have an answer as to what is keeping this show going on and why this is the drama, why this is the play set for us. The minister said, King, what you are asking is a highly evolved question on metaphysics and uh, in religion and spirituality and mysticism, there are very few people who can give a good answer, but you can find them. There are so many swamis and yogis and gurus and masters all moving around in the country. You hold a big feast, they will all come. They are very attracted to feasts. So hold a big feast, a big bandara or something and they will all flock there and then you can ask them questions and they will give you the answers. So the king held a very big feast, all day long feast, put a lot of good goodies and all the nice stuff on the table and all the swamis and yogis and gurus, they all turned up. And the king disguised himself as a commoner and walked amongst them and questioned them. But before he could question, he found all these learned men, these great scholars, these great enlightened people, they are fighting and quarreling amongst themselves. One said, I know better, I read more books than you did. The other said, no, this is not the meaning of Brahma. The other said, I know what Om stands for. You are not even pronouncing Om properly. This is not the way the world was created. This is not the sound of the Om that the world was created. They were discussing in such a strange way. The higher reality, he was sure that these people might have read books, but they have no idea of what reality is. They are not awakened people. And the king was very disappointed. He told his ministers and advisors, I am thoroughly disappointed with these so-called yogis, swamis and enlightened people. They make these learned scholars, they have read the scriptures, they can repeat books by heart, but they do not know what reality is. They don't behave like they know what reality is. They are fighting over petty words. Then the advisor said, King, if that is your intention to find the real reality and the truth, then one day feast was not enough. You must have a seven day feast and also give publicity to the feasts all over the country. So all the learned men and learned men may come and you may get your question answered. So the king held a seven day feast and sent messengers all over the country and people flocked in the big large number and he set up many camps and put up tents and put up large buildings to accommodate them, set up big kitchens for their feasting. And as the feasting was going on, the king disguised himself like a commoner and moved amongst them. And he found that even the more learned ones who had come from far off distances, from thousands of miles, were still scholars, learned men, but not enlightened men. They did not know what awakening was, what wakefulness was. They knew all the words without knowing the meaning. The king was very disappointed. And he told his ministers and advisors, I am really disappointed that I could not get an answer to my question, what is wakefulness or enlightenment? Then the minister's advisor said, Well, <clears throat> Majesty, what you are looking for then is a different kind of truth. You are talking of the higher wakeful truth. That you cannot get from these people who come to your feast. Then you have to go to a perfect master. And the king said, Is there one such? They said, Yes, we know one. He lives on the bank of a river in a very small hut. And you go and invite him. If you go personally, he might come on your invitation and give you the message of truth and reality. There was a hunchback mystic who used to live on the bank of a river named Ashtabhaka. So King Janak made the journey to Ashtabhaka and went to him and said, Ashtabhaka, I am very keen to know the truth and I believe you are a perfect master. You can give me the answer. I want to invite you to give me the answer and I want to invite all my relatives, other neighbors, kings, queens, princess, other nobility and royalty to hear your answers. Ashtabhaka said, King, you have taken all the trouble to come personally to invite me. I will respond to your invitation and come next Sunday to your palace to give you your answer. The king was very excited. He came back. He invited all his other folk and all relatives, nobles, princes, they all assembled in a big auditorium and they sat down and Ashtabhakar walked in with a few of his disciples and he came and sat on the stage. When people saw the hunchback, they all laughed. So Ashtabhakar said, King, 
You want to know what the price of leather is? What are you talking, Ashka Bhakta? I, I called you to give me spiritual answers on truth and reality. And he said, but I thought you had got leather merchants here. They looked at my skin and laughed. Then they all felt ashamed, laughing at this learned man. And they kept quiet. And then he said, King, what is your question? And the king said, King Janak said, Ashta Bhakta, tell me, what is the reality? What is truth? What is this whole world about? Why are we acting in this world and trying to make it our own when it doesn't belong to us? Tell, tell me the real, real thing. What is wakefulness? And the king added, Ashtra Bakar, I don't want you to tell me, do meditation for two months or two years and you will get an answer. I've tried that stuff. I want your, the knowledge instantly. I want instant knowledge. It sometimes gives me the impression the king must have been an American in past life. <laughs> Ashtavakar said, yes, I will give you instant knowledge, provided you pay the price for it. The king said, any price. My treasure, treasury and coffers are open to you. Tell me how much to pay. I am willing to pay any price for getting instant knowledge. Ashtavakar said, I want three things from you. The king said, why three? Take ten, twenty, take anything you like. Ashtavakar said, I don't want many things, just three. If you give me three things... I will give you instant knowledge. And he quoted his price. The king said, what is your price? He said, the three things are, give me your wealth, give me your body, give me your mind. If you give me these three things, I will give you instant knowledge. The king was so keen on this subject and had been searching for so long, he agreed to give all his wealth, his body and his mind to the mystic in order to get knowledge of the truth. Ashtabhaka said, King, have you given all these three things to me? King said, yes, in the presence of all these relatives of mine, all this nobility and royalty, I declare that all my wealth is yours, my body is yours, my mind is yours. The king said, then this body is mine. Why don't you go? Some of my disciples took off their shoes near the door when they entered. Why don't you put this body which belongs to me now on the shoes and sit there? And the king thought he's right. And I've given the body wherever he will say I'll have to place the body. So the king left his throne and walked down and sat on those shoes. And all the his relatives murmuring and whispering, what's happened to the king? He's gone mad. Just for this hunchback master, so-called master, he's uh, not forgetting he's a king and going and sitting on those shoes. The king heard this whisper. He said, well, I can't blame them after all. They have seen me in all my palaces and so on. And therefore, they have a right to feel like this. And he was thinking like this. Ashtabhakar shouted from the stage. King Janak, you have no business to think of those palaces and say they are my palaces. You gave them to me. How can you say that they are thinking right because of my palaces? Where are your palaces? And Ashtabhakar said, oh my God, he's right. I have given away the palaces to him. I have no business to think of the palaces. And Ashtabhakar shouted. King Janak, you have no business to think whether you have given away or not given away. You have given your mind to me. How can you think? And the king held his head like this and said, I can't even think. And he, for a moment, one single moment, caught his head. I can't think. And that was the moment of enlightenment and wakefulness. Just one moment of awakefulness. When the mind was filled, wakefulness came instantly. And Ashtabhaka called him back. He says, come back here. And he said, have you got the knowledge you were seeking? The king said, yes. He said, any questions? He said, no questions. He said, any doubts? He said, no doubts. This certainty of the one moment's wakefulness was more than all the study he had done all his life about the state of wakefulness. All the books he had read could not give him that certainty about that knowledge which one moment of wakefulness gave him. And he got that one moment of wakefulness with the grace of that master who made him stop using his mind for one moment. Therefore it is not. And the, and the Ashtabhakar master asked him, King, did it take more than an instant? And the king said, it took less than an instant. So it is not that you need time to know reality. You need that moment when you can wake up from this unreal world to know the reality. 
if you once know that reality it does not mean that you don't act in this world some people have this strange notion that if we came to know that this was a drama we we'll stop acting that we are acting because we take it as real the moment we came to know it is not real we we'll stop acting that is not true we'll act better because then we'll become actors we will assume that we are mad we are emotional we are doing these things because we'll be acting it is only when we are not aware of the acting that we want to stop acting which of course is an act by itself therefore when people want to live in this world and not really belong to the world that means get away from the pains and pleasures and unhappiness of this world they get that moment of wakefulness and retain the fact that our real world is another one we have created this world of a stage on which we are acting and they act with detachment keeping their attachment to a level where the master belong they act in this world with detachment and therefore they do not have any of the pains and sufferings of this world thank you very much